Welcome and thank you for joining us. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about what is known as ADHD. Many people have known about this particular, as it may be called, a disorder, but for many of us who have actually been labeled this, we find it to be more of a blessing. On the program today, we're going to be talking about accelerated learning and reading expert Ricky Linksman, who's the founder and director of the National Reading Diagnostic Institute and Keys Learning. It's based in Naperville, Illinois. She has been able to help cutting-edge brain research to raise K-12 students' reading levels in schools and homes around the world as much as two to five grade levels growth above one's age within just a few months. She's joining us on the program today to talk about her book, The Fine Line Between ADHD and Kinesthetic Learning. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, Ms. Ricky Linkstrom. Thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today, Ricky. I'm so glad to be here today. Yeah, how did you get involved with the uh, research of ADHD and kinesthetic learning? I began this, I can't quite, I began the search about 30 years ago when I saw that students were struggling with learning. And I saw that those kids who were doing well in school were very bright, excited, and felt good about themselves and had high self-esteem. But I saw the kids who were struggling became very sad, unmotivated, low self-esteem, and often referred to themselves as dumb and stupid. And I also saw a cycle of failure that led them to either drop out, tune out, or become class clowns. And I wanted to find a way to help them to learn because I believe every student has the capability to excel and achieve. And I wanted to end their frustration. I also found that the parents were equally frustrated because they didn't know how to help their kids. So in the field of education, I began research into what is the best way to reach every student from where they are and take them to the highest point they could. And that led me to realize that people learn in different ways. And so from that, I began developing techniques based on brain-based research to help students. And I found that when we taught students and the way they learned the best, they not only were able to achieve what the other students could achieve, but they were even able to excel and learn faster. So I saw the power of accelerated learning. And so I'm here today to share the message of hope with parents and teachers who are listening, or grandparents, or people who themselves have either ADHD or ADD or trouble learning, that it's not hopeless. There is solutions, and I want to share some of those solutions today in our interview, so they realize that their search through many, many places has not led them to the right technique yet, and once they find that technique, they'll see a world of difference and transformation in their child or themselves. Now, what exactly is a kinesthetic learner, as you call it? A kinesthetic learner is somebody whose processing is improved when they move, when they use their body, when they're physically involved. There are many ways of learning, and based on the experience and the stimulus we had as children, we have certain patterns and networks in our brain that get more practice, more usage, and more development. So a visual learner, for example, learns best when they can see the material with their eyes, obviously. Auditory learners learn best through hearing, listening, talking. Tactile learners learn best through their hands, from material, writing, drawing, making things with their hands. But a kinesthetic learner processes better when their muscles, their gross motor or large motor muscles are in motion. So they actually listen better when they're moving. They can process information visually when they're moving, and they can combine tactile and using their hands when their body has freedom of movement. So they need to move. They learn better and think better when they move. So what we find is if you go into a classroom, you see some kids are rocking back and forth in their chair. Some of them are like getting up to sharpen their pencil or go to the bathroom a lot. Or maybe even they throw a little wad of paper into a basket. 
not because they're trying to create trouble, but it's an excuse for them to get up, pick up the lot of paper, and put it in the basket. These are symptoms or expressions that they are trying to move because it is very uncomfortable for them to sit still all day long. You can kind of think about if you're a visual learner and somebody's lecturing to you and you say, well, show me the PowerPoint. I want to look at it myself. Or if somebody's auditory and is asked to do silent work, they want to talk about it. Well, that same frustration is what's going on inside the kinesthetic learner. They are more and more frustrated the more they're asked to sit still, hold their hands, and just look and listen. And so they're trying to create movement for themselves to, to alleviate this frustration. So if they see this, it means that student needs movement. And so what I've developed is ways to teach every subject a way that's kinesthetic and involves motion. And what I've discovered over testing thousands and thousands and thousands of students um, using these techniques, taking students from failure to success, was when we coupled movement with the lesson, they not only did as well as the other students, they actually excelled. They just became like a whole new student. You know what I really find amazing? You know, back when I was a young boy, I was actually labeled ADD. And there I was taking... Well, originally, I think it was a full pill of Ritalin so I could settle down and focus in class, but apparently it turned me into a super zombie. Then what happened was, well, let's cut him down to half a pill, and I'm still a zombie. <laughs> My mother said after a while, she says, look, I'm not really, really ready to raise a zombie here, so I'm not going to have him taking this nonsense anymore. What's interesting is what you're talking about here is it seems one of the troubles that ADD, ADHD alleged labels uh, have trouble reading, but I was a voracious reader. I just couldn't settle down in class because, uh, as I think most boys, just simply to the sheer fact, when you're young like that, you'd rather be out running around, not sitting there, you know, trying to learn to what you would seem to think is to be a bunch of nonsense unless it was really, really interesting. You know, this is a... Um very common what you're saying, and in fact, the reason I wrote the book, The Fine Line Between ADHD and Kinesthetic Learners, which has 197 kinesthetic activities to quickly improve reading, memory, and learning, and I call it the ultimate parent handbook for ADHD, ADD, and kinesthetic learners, is exactly for the situation you just described. I have found that 50,000 people come to my website com and readinginstruction.com every year, and the most visited place is people who are asking that same question and issue that your mother and you had, is what do I do for my child who's labeled ADHD, and how can I help them? And are they really ADHD, or are they mislabeled? And is the little one really helping them, or... Are they really not ADHD? Is it something else? And so this is the most common question. And the reason I call it a fine line between ADHD and kinesthetic learning is because a lot of people diagnose kids based on a checklist. A lot of times it's not even a medical diagnosis. There's a checklist. And some of the items on the ADHD or ADD checklist involve need to move or restless are always moving. And so on that basis, a lot of kids who I've seen and tested over the years had that characteristic, and so they were put on medication, thinking that was going to help them to read. So we have two situations. One is that you're describing that you were a great reader, but maybe in other subjects you were struggling, or maybe you lived a lot. But then there are other kids who are not great readers, and people seem to think by just putting them on medication, they're going to learn to read. Well, a pill is not a reading teacher. If someone does truly have ADHD, there may be cases where the medication is very helpful. And so I'm not saying not to take it or to take it. I'm just looking at it from another direction. I'm saying it could be they're struggling because 
they're kinesthetic learners and they're not being taught in their way. And so it looks like they're exhibiting signs of ADHD. So now what we have is students who don't have ADHD being mislabeled and put on medication thinking that's going to help them. And as you say in your case, you are zombied out. So what I'm suggesting that parents do is take a look at how their child learns. Whether or not they do have ADHD or they don't, one of the key things is Find out how your child learns the best, and then try as an intervention techniques to see if learning in their best way of learning makes a difference in teaching them how to read in a kinesthetic way if they're kinesthetic. And if you see improvement, we've had a lot of cases where children have been on medication for years and didn't show any improvement in school with the medication, still could not read. Suddenly, with these techniques, we're able to read. And I have seen hundreds and hundreds personally, and I've heard of thousands, taken off medication because they really were just kinesthetic learners who needed that technique. Now, in your book, uh, you outline what, about 197 kinesthetic activities to improve reading. Uh, in your book, uh, ADHD and Kinesthetic Learners. Tell us about just a couple of the activities for our listeners uh, to kind of give them an idea what it is that you help these people do. Yes, I'd love to share some of those. Um, first of all, is to understand your child. The first thing is to have the communication improve. And one of the things, before even I give the activities, that the book will share with parents, teachers, grandparents, is the characteristics and how to communicate and understand the kinesthetic child. And there are chapters that talk about the type of stimulus they need, the best ways to learn, how they think. Kinesthetic people think in a different way than the other types of learners, how to improve reading, how they create, ways of talking. For example, a lot of time parents will complain my child doesn't say much where the teachers will say he doesn't write much, he just gets to the point. Well, one of the characteristics of kinesthetic learners is not only are they moving physically, but they're moving quickly mentally. And if they can explain something quickly and in a short way, they feel, they feel that they've gotten out what they wanted to say. So there's a tendency to speak in short action words. So advice for parents, grandparents, teachers is, if you want your kinesthetic child to do something that you want him or her to do, then put it in action words. Don't go into long explanations. Just say, do this, jump to this, let's get this done, uh, run and get this done. So using an action word will perk up their attention. So that's one of the techniques. Their eye movements are different. When a kinesthetic learner is processing information, he or she does not give eye contact. This is best when their eyes are down and not looking at the speaker. So I don't know how many parents have come or called me and come to my reading institute and they go and say, my son or daughter doesn't look at me when I talk to him or her. Well, if the child is kinesthetic, he or she processes better when the eyes are not looking at the person. So I don't know how many kids got pulled up by the teacher for not looking at the teacher, but actually they're listening better when the eyes are not focused on the speaker. So that one tip itself might help the parent-child teacher-student relationship already because you won't be expecting those, that eye contact and knowing that they actually listen better when they were not looking at you. Uh-huh. Um, that seating, where to seat them, for example, in the classroom, uh, put them in the back of the room where they can get up and up and down freely without disturbing the visual sight of the other students. Um, the best way of talking. There's also um, how they can learn any subject by movement. So let me give you some tips. For example, let's say you're trying to teach math to a kinesthetic learner. Instead of having them repeat multiplication table or the addition or subtraction tables. What you can do is lay out, what I suggest is get like 20 pieces of construction paper, for example, different colors, like maybe alternating, and have this 
child writes in large size the numbers, zero on one, one on the other two, and alternate colors for even and odd. And lay this timeline of actual, let's say, 9 by 12 construction paper on the floor and put up a question like 2 plus 2 equals. And then explain that to, do, to learn this kinesthetically, they would start on the top number, so you get on the number 2 on the line, and jump two places, 2 plus 2. So starting from 2, jump 2 more, and then I ask them what number they're on. And they'll look down, they'll see they're on number 4. Then they can go and write on the board 2 plus 2 is 4. Or let's say 3 plus 5. Let them start on 3 and jump 5 spaces. They'll see they land on 8, and then they'll be able to put 3 plus 5 is 8. That is getting the concept of addition into the child's brain kinesthetically. Mm -hmm. And by doing this, they make that connection between those visual numbers that meant nothing to them or your auditory explanation of adding, which meant nothing to them, by even physically feeling what jumping from the first number plus the second number lands them on the last number, which is the answer. So that's one example of kinesthetic math. For kinesthetic phonics, for example, like I've developed an entire K-12 college curriculum in phonics from learning the alphabet to words for the ACT and SAT test using kinesthetic methods. So, for example, when learning a pattern, instead of just sitting and writing it, you have them stand up and write it with their large arm muscles in the air or on a whiteboard so that not just their fingers are engaged, but their whole arm muscles are engaged in writing it while saying it. And um, in this way, they're getting the patterns into their body. And they're not just getting it visually and auditory, they're getting it through their best way of learning. So that's another technique. For comprehension, for example, let's say you're going to, excuse me, let's say you're going to teach me an idea. So instead of just sitting and reading or listening to a lecture, they actually get up and might demonstrate using real objects, the main idea and the details, by finding actual objects in the room, one that represents the main idea. So let's say, example, you want to teach main idea, and you say, okay, the main idea is fruit. Let's find the details, and they'll find an apple, orange, and banana. Or you give them apple, orange, and banana, and say, what is the name for this group? And they'll say fruit. They've actually picked up these objects, they lay them on a table, they're moving them around, and then they can connect that with the main idea. And the main idea might be putting it into a basket to illustrate the main idea represents all the items in the group. So those are a few samples from the book. I've said 197, and that's just a small portion of the thousands that I have in um, my reading programs from ADHD to A, these to reading success. So these are variations of programs where we can teach kinesthetic activities. I have another book, Kinesthetic Vocabulary Activities Your Child Would Love. I have um, the Off the Wall Phonics. It's an entire kinesthetic program of phonics, which works for ADHD, ADD, ADD and kinesthetic learners, plus um, comprehension and test taking as part of keys to reading success. So these have helped. Um, not only individuals, but entire school districts who are failing were able to go from the low state standards in reading to reading and exceeding in less than a school year, so about eight months. And that includes kids who not just regular ed, special ed, ADHD, ADD, dyslexia, and um, gifted, um, even kids who are learning English as a second language. It definitely accelerates the speed at which kinesthetic learning now, I just wanted your opinion, Ricky, about the education system, especially when it comes from kindergarten through 12th grade. Do you feel that perhaps it's been it's tremendously outdated, especially when we're talking about public schools where most kids go, and that we really need to revamp what's going on in our school system? That's a good question. Um, the school districts that I've worked with, not only in this country, but I'm also having um, school districts like in South Africa and places around the world, 
when I've worked with the teachers, they themselves have come to conclusions based on seeing the difference in their students by finding out the student's best way of learning, whether it's kinesthetic, visual, auditory, tactile, and we also look at what I call super links, which includes left and right brain learners, left brain hemispheric and right brain hemispheric learners, because the combination is also very significant. There's a difference between a visual left brain learner and a visual right brain <coughs> learner. Um, I found we accelerated further when we could um, go down even to the level of how they process information, whether sequentially or globally, or whether through images or words. And in the trainings, the teachers themselves, when they've tried these techniques, they have They've said this has revolutionized their own teaching. They've said that it has given them a renewed lift in life because they have been tired of working themselves to death, trying to get information into the kids, and the teachers themselves are frustrated when they teach the same thing week after week after week and the kids don't get it. You know, I mean, think how hard. And they work hard. I mean, they don't too much. They work hard. And they're frustrated, like, how can I get this across to Johnny? Or some kids get left back. Right. Some kids, they don't get it in the 10 months. they got to go to summer school. What happens in summer school? They get two more months of the same techniques that didn't work the rest of the year, and they expect to see change. But when they saw the transformation, number one, the teachers were excited, even parents who are involved in teaching their own kids, because they see results right away. They feel that fulfillment, that the kids are getting it. The kids are happy. The kids are engaged. I mean, when I've done demonstrations at school, the kids would be so engaged in the activities that they wouldn't even notice that the teacher was not standing over them anymore because we love what we're doing, you know, whether mm -hmm. the teacher's there or not. And so they're excited. And then they see the kids, their discipline problem has improved. Why are kids having discipline problems? Either they're bored or they're frustrated. You never see a different. When a kid's working on his uh, playing a video game, do they look bored? Are they a discipline problem? No, they're engaged. You see kids engaged all the time on their computers and their iPads and their all kinds of games and sports. They're acting out and bored and leading to discipline problems. But when they're learning in their best way, they're excited, they're engaged. And I had one school that was notorious. It was an inner city type of school. It had um, high minority, high poverty, and everybody felt it was hopeless. The kids would never learn. The uh, dean's office was filled all the time with kids in trouble. Well, after using these techniques over a period of months, the, uh, the dean of uh, discipline actually said that he's getting bored because nobody's being referred to his office anymore. <coughs> he's getting lonely. He has only a couple of cases a week now because discipline problems drop. And I'm talking about uh, junior high school, a middle school, where already you know, kids are, have a lot of discipline problems. But it eliminated that. And so teachers themselves felt like they had a renewed love of learning of teaching. They enjoyed their students, they connected with their students, their relationship increased, and they felt that satisfaction that they had made a difference. So I think, like you said, people realize there is another way. If you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to get more of the same. But when a school district tries something new and sees the results, they'll, they'll feel really glad they did. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of staying with current research and trying new things that have been proven to work. You know, Ricky, it's it's fascinating, this whole subject, you know, and I wish that we had, you know, a full hour to be able to do this in many ways. Uh, but I, I, I reflect uh, back to a time when I was in the sixth grade, and you say that's sometimes where the real trouble goes is, you know, in middle school uh, where there seems to be an increased level of discipline problems. Not that there isn't any in grade school, and they certainly seem kind of big in high school. Uh, but what was interesting is in the sixth grade there was a particular class that was history, and... Uh, Basically what this guy did is he would send out a sheet of questions and then you would try to answer them. And I sat there and I kept getting, he would give, it was either satisfactory work or unsatisfactory. And I'm going through this and I'm just flunking out left and right on these things. I'm just not getting it, okay? 
then all of a sudden, I can't remember if it was in the sixth grade, but by the seventh grade, you know, I had him all three, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I think it was in the seventh grade. All of a sudden, something clicked, and I got it. He was literally in his questions providing clues to how you could find the answers. But he never told me this. But all of a sudden, as I'm looking at this, my paper started coming back, and I'm getting S's and S pluses, and I'm like, oh, I'm getting this. It was like a little hunting game. And it excited me so much that I had achieved that. And I think uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that parents should come to understand is, look, maybe if you just turn that, that, that lens just a bit where it becomes a game, and I'm sure that's what a lot of your activities help these kids do, is that if you could just do that to where they become hunters, the grade doesn't matter in as much as the fact that they're actually engaged as you're talking about. Is that something you would agree with? I believe you hit the nail right on the head just now. Um, the kinesthetic approach is a game approach. It's, a, it's teaching the rules of the game, how to play the game, and then letting them play the game, and modeling for them when they make a mistake. So instead of saying you're wrong and marking something with a red pencil and X, it's actually looking at what they did and modeling or coaching or demonstrating what they need to do to rectify that and try it a different way. And so you're absolutely right. The entire method of kinesthetic learning involves a series of games and activities which lead them to that challenge and success. In fact, off-the-wall phonics is broken down as 10 game levels. Each game level has 10 games. And by playing these games, you go from level one, you end up the 10th level is college level reading. So we've taken kids who are um, elementary, K1, 2, 3, 4, and they have finished the 10th game and they've come out reading at high school and college level. And so, and part of the kinesthetic learner is they love to win. And this is kind of counterintuitive because these are the ones who usually are the ones who've been failing in class, if not being taught in a kinesthetic way. These also are the kids who are most likely put into Title I remedial reading because they're not being taught in their way. And yet inside of them, one of the kinesthetic qualities is love to win, achieve, and reach goals. So part of the method of teaching them is the rewards for achieving a goal, like whether it's game points or prizes or throwing a ball into a basketball as a reward and getting a free throw. And so kids no longer feel reading a chore or learning a chore. They think they're coming to play games and they're having fun. And in the process of having fun, their brain connections are being made and they're achieving. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right, the game approach. And that's what the 197 activities in the fine line between ADHD and kinesthetic learners are all game and activity based. The off the wall phonics is totally game. Kinesthetic vocabulary, child loves game. And um, they're not just sitting board games, they're actually learning games where their body's involved and they're having that fulfillment of winning. And so that itself is a motivator. So you, what you came to in middle school is you actually discovered the secrets to your own learning, but it took you so many years to get there. So I'm proposing parents get educated so they don't have to have their kids go through such a long process to find success. They can have success starting today, right away. Now, for people who are wanting to find out how to grab a hold of this, you have two websites they can go to. One is Keys to Learning Success dot com all one word forward slash fine line ADHD that's keys to learning success dot com forward slash fine line ADHD and then the other one is off the wall phonics all one word dot com correct yes that's correct um, they can go there and they could um, access the, uh, the book and the games and um, then they can uh, get the information. I have also many, many pages of free information and tips for parents. So if they start there, they'll be led to a wealth of information. Um, 
on how to help their kids. So um, if the teachers can use this in the classroom, parents and grandparents could have uh, fun with their kids doing it. So you're absolutely right. So it's keys to learning success.com forward slash capital F fine, capital L line, all caps ADHD, and the other is off the wall phonics.com. If they want to email me, they can also email me at info, I N F O, at keyslearning.com. Keys like house keys, so learning.com. The book is The Fine Line Between ADHD and Kinesthetic Learners. Our guest, Ms. Ricky Linksman. Ricky, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And I hope, um, parents, it's not hopeless. You don't need to be frustrated. There are solutions to your child's problem. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you again, Ricky. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do have a free weekly e-newsletter. It comes out by email every week. We'll have a hot link to this uh, interview here, so that way you can find out more information about it. We again thank you for joining us. I'm Daniel Davis. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.